So in the first part of this lecture, we looked at some of the motivating causes behind the interest in energy consumption uh, in, in how buildings perform. And we got to sort of the mid-1990s, and we were looking at some of the so-called high-tech uh, approaches to uh, building performance. The 90s were a time when there was a growing realization that we were using more energy than we could uh, sustainably produce. Also, that the, the burning of fossil fuels in particular was having a, a, a really serious impact on the atmosphere that would lead eventually to, to climate change. High-tech architects were some of the first to realize that this demanded a, a kind of systematic approach. And they began looking at buildings, not just from a structural and constructional point of view, but also uh, from an energy consumption point of view. And that began playing a bigger and bigger role in what we think of today as building performance. There were new tools that came online in the 90s. So you see, for instance, buildings uh, being tested in both analog ways, a wind tunnel on the left, a sort of time-honored way of, of looking at how air moves around a, a building form. Um, but these were supplemented by increasingly sophisticated digital tools, uh, in particular computational flow dynamics, which you see uh, an example of on the right, that helped designers to shape buildings to take advantage not only of the solar energy that naturally was flowing across their sites, but also increasingly the wind energy uh, that, that, was, that was flowing uh, as well. This led in many cases to new forms, but also to new techniques. So here an unbuilt uh, competition entry by the Richard Rogers Partnership in 1991 looked at using precisely the prevailing winds to exhaust hot air from an office space uh, using the, the shape of the roof as a way to encourage that kind of beneficial airflow. So you can see the diagram uh, lower left, taking fresh air in from uh, the ground level, uh, where it's shaded, where there, there are trees that are offering uh, uh, some cooler, uh, sort of bio-conditioned air, opening up the facade and using the natural tendency of heat from, again, computer monitors, from people uh, to rise and exhausting it at the top. In the Rogers scheme, this was supplemented in some cases by solar chimneys. So pieces that stuck up uh, encased in glass that really sort of supercharged that uh, effort that took uh, hot air and really blasted it out using passive methods. The stronger the sun is shining, the harder the, the system works. And you can see here that was combined in Rogers' proposal with a heat exchanger that would use the waste heat to actually power uh, machinery uh, elsewhere, elsewhere in the building. Um, some of these got uh, pretty fanciful, almost like science fiction-y. This is a, a proposal that the Rogers Partnership did uh, subsequently for a, a commercial building in Japan that was to use not only a solar chimney that you see on the right, uh, but also a, a sort of uh, rotating, almost like windmill vortex uh, machine that would take advantage of wherever the wind was blowing to help exhaust uh, the air, air from the building. At the other end of the spectrum, a particularly uh, important project by another high-tech architect, Renzo Piano, um, looked at ways to passively uh, use airflow uh, on the site, uh, but also began to look at what today we think of as embodied energy. In other words, Piano's realization was that the, the, the need to transport materials plays a big role in the energy consumption of a building before it's even occupied, uh, what today we would call the, the carbon footprint of a, of a building. In fairness, this was a, a unique situation. A piano was commissioned to do a cultural center on the island of New Caledonia, which is in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. So there were economic reasons, financial reasons, uh, to try to limit the amount of transportation of materials uh, that, that was being used anyway. Piano, with this project, began to recognize, though, that this was another factor in how we think about building performance, that the, the energy, or today we would say the embodied carbon uh, in a building, is, is a key part of the, of the formula for understanding that building's impact on the environment. <clears throat> Piano's scheme was for a, a, a very long distributed building. You can see the site plan here. It's, it's the, the long arcing building in the lower right. Uh, an appropriate climatic form. If you go back to Old J in the tropics, we want to increase the perimeter. We want to open up the building as much as possible uh, to the prevailing winds. 
as the old Jays suggested, piano looked to vernacular building traditions to, for inspiration for how the building might uh, be able to perform in this climate. And there was a local building tradition using thatched roofs, very tall thatched roofs that would encourage uh, heat to rise, to draw air in uh, past stone foundations that you can see in, in the section on the right. Uh, and that would naturally cool the building by, by drawing this air in and allowing the warm air then to evacuate uh, through, the, through the thatched roofs. Piano reinterpreted this. Uh, his section uh, involved these very, very large wooden kind of scoops or shells that you see on the left, uh, blocking the, the uh, sun from hitting the, uh, the, the, the glazed, slanted glazed facade that you see over the exhibition areas uh, and using the, the natural uh, wind blowing over these wooden shells to extract hot air from the top of the, of the galleries. And that extract then would pull air through the, the lower spaces that you see uh, on the right, again, bringing air in just as in the Rogers building uh, from near the ground level and below uh, a clump of trees. Upper left are Piano's sketches uh, sent uh, to the, the client by fax, a nice little um, time capsule there. And you can see that the, the building could be open or closed, and it would use these wooden uh, scoops, these wooden forms, uh, to help either pull the wind in during uh, light, um, light uh, windy days, or to actually shut the building down and protect it in uh, cyclonic uh, events. Maybe more importantly though, on the right you see both a mock-up and a model that show piano thinking about how to build these things using local materials, using local timber uh, that could be harvested even adjacent to the, to the site. That of course reduced the amount of shipping uh, that, the, that the project needed to do. And piano wrote of being very conscious that uh, a building of this scale would be more efficient if it could use the sort of highly engineered, highly fabricated uh, steel jointing that you see on the right. But if the bulk of the building could be manufactured from local materials, it would save on the shipping costs, would also therefore sh save on the fuel that it would take to ship all of those pieces from some other place. So the steel here is fabricated in, in Europe. That is all shipped, but as you can see, it's a small fraction of the total bulk of, of the building. The rest of it really is from locally grown, renewable resources. Uh, the trees can be replanted, they can uh, be, be regrown, and the, the harvesting can take place almost adjacent to the site so that the transportation, again, something that we've looked at since the beginning of the course, can be minimized, right? Easy to get uh, materials back and forth. And this idea of, of trying to balance both the energy performance of the building during its lifetime and the carbon footprint of the building going into construction um, began to permeate through a lot of projects that were done in, in the late 90s. Um, here's the Richard Rogers partnership with a, a slightly more modest proposal for combining uh, passive and active uh, ventilation strategies with a very localized material. This is a set of law courts in Bordeaux, the, the wine producing region or one of the wine producing regions of France. And you can see here that in the summer and winter, the building has two different uh, sort of modes of operation. In the summer, it's, it's really about trying to pull air uh, into this very large atrium through these kind of uh, flower bud shaped uh, courtrooms, uh, exhausting as much uh, heat as possible. And in the winter, it's about trying to use the sun to heat air and then distributing that air not only through the courtrooms, but also through the, the, the office spaces as well. In winter, Bordeaux doesn't get that cold, so it's a relatively easy thing to, to produce warm air. One of the real advances of this building, though, was Rogers, just like Piano at New Caledonia, looking to local building traditions, and in particular, the traditions in the region of building uh, wine casks, but also of using, again, uh, shaped roofs that allow for passive ventilation, right? Important in keeping the local produce uh, at a reasonable temperature. Lower left, you see a, a boat made by local craftsmen. The, the woodworking technique to make the, the wine casks um, is, uh, is particularly advanced in Bordeaux. And Roger's idea was to simply take 
those ideas and as you see in the the cartoon on the upper right like basically making wine casks into courtrooms so here on the left the exterior of the courtroom is looking very much like the exterior of wine barrels and on the right the interior you can see the the uh, building is taking in sun for daylighting uh, but all of those uh, um, voids uh, in the walls or some of the voids in the walls anyway are about moving air through the the, the space uh, in different ways depending on whether it's winter uh, or summer and maybe to my mind the most impressive uh, versions of these was a, a building that certainly doesn't appear to be a high-tech building but uh, the engineering firm of Arabs uh, worked with the Pierce Partnership Architects to develop a, an office building in Harare, Zimbabwe, an extraordinarily hot climate that would really learn not from not so much from human vernacular architecture, uh, but from the natural world. Um, Arab's uh, idea behind the uh, Eastgate offices was to adapt the thermal um, strategy of termite mounds, a, a local uh, phenomenon uh, in Zimbabwe where millions of termites would build these underground uh, chambers that would be the, the sort of breeding colony or, or, or nursing colony and then these giant mud sails that would be uh, percolated through uh, with these openings that would really uh, absorb the sunlight the the mud sails would heat up that would drive uh, it would warm the air in, the, in these tubes which would then rise that would energize the system, pulling air through these long tunnels uh, that would produce, provide cool air uh, that would ventilate the, 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 the nursery chambers uh, underground. In the case of Eastgate, <clears throat> Arabs uh, worked with uh, Pierce to develop a, a very heavy masonry structure. Again, not something that we've been used to. We've been seeing structures and materials get lighter and lighter and lighter. Um, here, though, the, the masonry is a locally produced material, so it's easy to transport. And in this case, it has very high thermal mass. It holds on to heat uh, for a long time and releases that heat uh, very slowly. So it takes a long time to warm up, a long time to cool down. Arabs adapted the idea of the termite mound using these chimneys that you see at the top that uh, absorb the morning sun, they get hot, and they begin to evacuate air through uh, thermal stratification. Hot air rises through the chimneys. It begins to pull air through the building from the ground level. And as that air gets pulled through all of this shaded thermal mass, uh, it naturally gets tempered so that the air warms up slowly. It removes the heat from the thermal mass as it, it rises through the building uh, and finally gets exhausted uh, under these very, very warm uh, masonry roofs. Um, here you can see that the, the strategy relies on a diurnal rhythm. So at night, the building is opened up, the, the thermal mass is allowed to cool, and during the day, the, the air that's brought in gives up its heat to that relatively cool thermal mass, but also because it's being heated by the chimneys and pulled through the building, uh, it tends to pull air through windows, through ventilation shafts, that provide ventilation and cooling for the for the offices within. This, to my mind, is an interesting project because it reverses so much of the quote unquote high tech logic, right? Machinery produced, factory produced, prefabricated elements, lightweight elements, lightweight structure. Well, here the climate begins to drive the architecture, and instead of the structure being lightweight and mass produced. The structure is basically handmade. It's made of, of, of bricks and, and precast units. Uh, and the, the weight or the mass of the building is actually useful from a climate point of view. You see other examples of this where thermal mass begins to drive the, the architecture of the building. Uh, Michael Hopkins in 1995 doing or winning the competition that, that Rogers had lost uh, earlier. Um, Hopkins, though, produced a building that had some similar features that relied on thermal mass and natural ventilation to reduce the energy footprint, uh, the life cycle cost, we would say today, uh, of, of the structure. For Hopkins, though, it was about looking to the past for suggestions. And Hopkins, first of all, plans the building out so that it has these relatively narrow footprints 
and that allows cross ventilation, right? Something that uh, we had lost in the 50s and 60s with air conditioning. Here, Hopkins is returning to that, returning to the light well or, or the courtyard that lets daylight come into the office building, but also allows for cross ventilation. The skin of the building is porous, so air is allowed to come in. You can see that the structure is heavy masonry and, and precast. That uh, masonry is uh, exposed in the winter, as you see here, shaded in the summer by these big overhanging eyebrows. And that means that the, the, the air that's coming in is warmed a little bit in the winter. It's cooled a little bit uh, in the summer. The real kind of engine of the project, though, are these towers, these glass block towers with these conical hats. Uh, and in the summer, those hats are allowed to rise. The glass towers, of course, bring in a tremendous amount of solar gain that heats air inside, which is exhausted from under the hat. And that generates this kind of uh, ventilation throughout the building where air is pulled from the exterior. Uh, it comes through the building, it heads for the, the towers and the, the pull of the stratification energizes the system. Again, the, the hotter the day, the more the sun is shining, the harder the system works to, to, to ventilate the, the building. And Foster's continues to do projects based on what it had learned at, at Stanford as well, but also picking up on this idea of, of passive ventilation. Uh, here, a school in southern France that really borrows from uh, a project by Jean Prouvé that we looked at, the Maison Tropicale. If you remember, that building used a, a kind of sandwich of metal roofs to create airflow within the house. And here, Foster does the same thing to create a passively ventilated school. It's a two-story building, relatively narrow section, so already there's the possibility for cross-ventilation. You can see in this section that there are windows open on the edges and then transom windows over the door that looks into this central uh, corridor, this double height uh, central corridor. There's shading on the south, both in the form of trees, but also these, these metal louvers. And that means that there is constantly kind of shaded cool air adjacent to the building, both under the louvers and on the north side in the, in the shadow of the building itself. There's a little hat or monitor on top that runs the whole length of the school. That monitor is operable, so air can be allowed to, um, to exit from that. When the sun hits that, just like the glass towers at Inland Revenue, that energizes the system. It warms the air, the air comes rushing out, and that vacuum pulls air through the rest of the building. Windows in the, on the shaded facades of the building open up, and again, the hotter the day, the, the more the sun is shining, the harder that monitor works at pulling air and the more ventilation you get running uh, across the classrooms. The central corridor also becomes the kind of main social space and all of those uh, concrete vaults uh, are constantly shaded. So they remain relatively cool. Uh, they, they are uh, ventilated by the, the section. There's space between the vaults uh, and the roof. Uh, and that means that there is a, a constant kind of thermal mass that warms up very slowly uh, during the day. The building uh, originally had space for a mechanical system, but never needed one. It opened without any air conditioning uh, and continues to function as a school uh, to this day. That's at the kind of low end, low, low tech uh, end, but there's also a kind of high tech version uh, of, of these passive systems that, that uh, becomes very popular uh, around the, the turn of the century. Um, Germany, again, is really one of the centers for this, where energy is intentionally expensive. And this drives architects, but also clients and developers uh, to really improve these systems, to take this, some of the systems that we've seen and to make them work uh, more and more efficiently. Um, here, Thomas Herzog's uh, headquarters for the Expo 2000 uses uh, a double skin system. You see details of that on the left. Uh, that double skin facing uh, south and east uh, warms up, produces these kind of um, energy flows similar to the ones in the, in the Hopkins chimney, but here within the facade of the building. There's an increasing emphasis on those double skins, not only for 
what they can do for daylighting, but how they can themselves energize the ventilation system, the passive ventilation system in a building. Um, one of the most sophisticated versions of these uh, was the, the retrofit uh, of a, a building in uh, formerly East Berlin by Sauerbrook and Hutton. Arabs, again, the, the environmental engineers for this. The new skin that goes on it has these multiple phases. So it can use the sun to energize the double skin facade and to pull air uh, through the building. Again, that lets the, the building bring in daylight without bringing in a lot of heat gain. But as you can see from the section, it also comes with the possibility of opening the inner skin, opening or closing the inner skin, so that that whoosh of heated air can also extract from the ceiling of the offices within, extract the warm air uh, and, and get rid of it through the, through the double skin. That system again can be sealed up or both sides can be open depending on the way the wind is blowing uh, to provide for cross ventilation. And Sauerbrook and Hutton designed this airfoil at the top that's designed to really increase the flow through the, the double skin of the building to, to really energize uh, that system and to provide the, the most uh, possible uh, ventilation. Here you can see what it looks like. Again, the depth of the facade is something that the architects in this case are kind of drawing inspiration from for the, the aesthetic of the building, a deeper, richer facade. And they're emphasizing this, of course, with uh, a good bit of, of color. The most dramatic version of these uh, is, was a, a tower by Foster and Partners that was not only the, 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 the hailed as the first green skyscraper or green mega tower, it was also briefly Europe's tallest skyscraper. So here we see the, the kind of um, high-tech emphasis on structure and the increasing high-tech emphasis on environmental performance really coming together. The Commerce Bank Tower uh, headquarters for one of Germany's largest banks and from the very beginning, the, the bank wanted a, a building that would save them money in terms of the energy uh, consumption, but that would also be a kind of statement about the bank's intentions going forward. So again, the, the, the environmental performance as both a, a kind of economic uh, boon, but also very clearly as a, as a kind of statement, almost a, a, a commercial for the, for the uh, bank's intentions. The plan of the bank is a, a sort of curved triangle, and the, the offices wrap around uh, the central atrium. The detail on the left shows that the atrium opens up on various sizes in these on sides uh, in these sky gardens that introduce trees, biomass to the building, but also really feed air into that central uh, atrium that becomes a, a, a chimney, really, for, uh, for exhausting. Uh, the inner uh, parts of the building. Germany has uh, environmental legislation that re requires any workspace to be within a certain distance from a window. So that naturally legislates the, the thin floor plates uh, that we saw Michael Hopkins working with that go back really to 19th century ideas about cross ventilation. And here you can see Commerce Bank is basically built around this giant triangular light court in the center that allows light, but also air uh, to, to come into those offices that, that face it. On the right, you see the, the giant kind of chimney or, or light court that, that functions again as a stratification element. So warm air in that chimney starts to move upwards. As it moves upwards, it moves upwards, it pulls air through the sky gardens, but also energizes uh, double skins on the interior uh, offices. Those are small, they're just one story, but they're very effective in kind of bringing air in at the base and exhausting it at the top. So bringing cool air in at the bottom of the window and then using the, the power of uh, the, the, the kind of suction of the air rising through that central chimney to draw the warm air out at the, at the ceiling level. And here you can see in winter, the system can be kind of closed up a little bit so that it holds on to the heat uh, Frankfurt gets uh, relatively chilly. In the summer, the building really opens up, uh, and those uh, those combined solar engines uh, are used to cool the offices on the exterior, but the solar chimney in the middle also cools the offices uh, on the interior. 
Foster, of course, very interested in displaying the, the way that the buildings work. Here you can see the double skin in the offices and one of these large uh, windows that encloses the sky garden uh, that allows for air to come in and out. You can see the, the operable windows in it, um, but that also provides enough protection from rain uh, and wind that those sky gardens can be used as, as social spaces. And here, an interior of a, a typical office, you can see the relatively complicated windows that are needed to take advantage of the, uh, the, the, the natural ventilation, but also the view that these offices get of those sky gardens and, and of the, the, the central uh, atrium. So that basically every office, even those on the light court, have access to actual, not just fresh air, but also blue sky, right? They can see out through the, the sky gardens uh, to the city beyond. When we come back, I want to finish both with a, a, another German project by Foster's that I think really showed the, the growing importance of uh, ecological response in a, a political project, uh, in this case in Germany, and then look a little bit at the, the way that our understanding of environmental performance uh, changed throughout the early 2000s to, more, to take on uh, more readily uh, the idea of embodied uh, carbon. Uh, and to, to sort of set that up for the final lecture, where we are today, the problems that we uh, deal with in terms of the, the ecology of the building, but also the life cycle and embodied energy that, that any of our buildings create. <laughs>